And now, here to talk Twitter, please welcome MIT Media Lab fellow Bridget Mendler and The Atlantic's Derek Thompson. Great. Hello, everybody. Hello again. Um, So the last time I was up on this stage, uh, I talked with Joey Ito a bit about how there is um, a perceived gap between sort of the algorithmic intelligence of a lot of people who work on AI and the more humanistic intelligence of some people who might be on the East Coast or in media or in other other companies. But as lots of people pointed out very helpfully on Twitter, and I agree with with their their criticism, this is is a spectrum. It's not as if there are two groups of intelligences and absolutely no overlap, but rather you have a lot of people who are in the middle, who have a bit of algorithmic intelligence and are interested in AI and network science, but they also, you know, like acting and singing. And so how perfect to be able to come back with someone who has been on maybe the only person who's ever had experience with both the Disney Channel and MIT Media Lab. Oh, gosh. (laughs) um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey from Disney to MIT? Uh, Yeah, sure. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, My name is Bridget Mendler, by the way. Um, I have two engineer parents. My mom's an architect. My dad designs car engines. So uh, there was a lot of mathy, science-y talk going on as a kid. But I was the nine-year-old that wanted to be an actress. <laughs> so they were kind of thrown by that. Um, but they were also very supportive. And um, I started working on Disney Channel at 15. And it was pretty much constant for the next six years of my life. Um, also started a a music career during that time. And for me, social media kind of wove into all of that when I was going on my first tour. Um, I was encouraged to set up accounts on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook in order to sort of like engage with people who were following my acting in music. And um, yeah, it was it was a crazy time. It was a it was a time when there was like a a ton of new people coming to my page. Like I'd, I'd look after a week and there were like a hundred thousand new followers. Um, so I was like, wow, who are all of these people? <laughs> um, and I guess the cool thing from that was to discover they were very diverse, um, from like every nook and cranny of the planet, um, which was really cool. And, and I was super curious about who those people were. And, uh, I found a lot of common interests at the Media Lab with understanding the humans that are interacting with technology. Um, I, I was filming a movie actually in Massachusetts last May and on an off day from set, my uncle took me to the Media Lab and I was just like blown away. I thought it was the coolest place in the world. And uh, so naturally, my, my response was to, to use Twitter. I tweeted Joey Ito and uh, <laughs> was like, hey, can we talk? Because it seems like you're doing a lot of really cool stuff here. And uh, he responded. And next thing I knew, I was, I was here at the Media Lab. And I, I now work with uh, Deb Roy, his group at Social Machines and their work at Cortico on the, the health of public sphere discourse online. Uh, and it's I love it. Really That's fun. the best application story I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about what you're working on here. Yes. So I actually have a couple of slides. Um, I, I learned how to do a little bit of coding, and I also was helped by a lot of people within the group to... Um, to sort of visualize in, this visualization is in three dimensions, what happens when somebody tweets and gets a lot of responses. So my interaction with social media has always been one of real humanity and intimacy at scale. And that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, So, you know, I, I was kind of captivated by this example because she's saying something that's very like human to a bunch of people and you'll see she got 842 responses. And this is Emma Gonzalez. She was uh, one of the teenagers uh, at Parkland. Yes. And she tweeted this on May 12th, 2018. Was that the day of uh, the the protests, the demonstrations? Uh, no, I, I can't verify that. And I actually think this was this was just, you know, unprompted by an event. I think this was just coming from her heart and mind. Um, But yeah, so kind of exploring this crazy oxymoron of humanity and intimacy at scale. Uh, And 
I do that by looking at tweets like trees. <laughs> so um, if you were to imagine this is the beginning of the tree, her post, uh, when somebody responds, this is a branch that comes off. So for example, this is David Hogg. Um, he responded with this tweet saying, it's okay to be strong, brave, and sad all at the same time. Feeling is what makes us human. Feeling is why we fight for those that no longer can. Feeling is the light, it's the dark, it's the hope. It's what makes you you. You are the change young people will win. So lots of people responded to him too. So I was kind of like, all right, well, here's an example of a girl. And what does it look like when a whole bunch of people respond? It creates this very organic looking structure. Um, and so another feature of these trees is a, uh, a toxicity scaling that we did uh, because not, not all posts are going to be like sunshine and rainbows. You know, Twitter sometimes has nasty things on it too. Um, but so this is an example of, of one like sort of uh, toxic chain of conversation. Um, so those are the two features we're looking at right now. We're looking at the structure and trying to scratch the surface of looking at the content. So you are, you're visualizing these conversations that are happening online. Mm -hmm. And you can, it's interesting because when you think about, you know, what's the most sort of fecund part of the tree? What, part, what branch is, is growing the most? Sometimes you might think, okay, maybe that's a branch that's really, really helpful, where a lot of people are coming together in order to discuss something that's important. It's yeah. a healthy conversation. But as you just showed, there are other parts of the tree where they're growing really quickly, not because they're, they're healthy conversations, but because they're toxic. Because yeah. a lot of people are, are sniping at each other, or trolling and dunking. Um, tell us, how do you identify the difference between the healthy parts of the tree and the unhealthy part of this communication tree? Yeah, uh, I, I think the visual tool is really helpful. Um, and this is one example, but we've seen a lot of different structures and we kind of have some, <laughs> some little corny terms for them, like a shrub. That's one that doesn't get a lot of activity. Um, there's also ones that can uh, really grow in uh, this sort of nasty, gnarly way because there's, there's sort of a virality going on. Um, so I think the structure is revealing, but like you're saying, there's a lot of different things that could be going on, a lot of different reasons why somebody might be uh, getting a lot of activity. So I do think the toxicity is helpful for that. Um, another feature we're exploring looking at is like repeat users. Um, you know, how, how many times is one person continuing to reoccur in that particular portion of the thread. Um, but open to a lot of other suggestions on that. Um, right now, it's, it's kind of about finding the patterns of, of right now where toxicity and structure overlap to have um, different cases. Right. It's so just so interesting to me that you can map a conversation. And just by looking at the visual, you can identify whether it's a conversation that's healthy or whether it's a conversation that has some toxic elements to it. Mm. So what can we learn from these sort of trees? What, what, how can we, how can essentially, you know, I won't extend the gardening metaphor too far, but how can we sort of learn from the healthy trees and say, this is, these are the sort of conversations that we want to promote online? Um, I think one of the big things for me is about navigation. Um, and I, I don't know really the ultimate case for these trees, but when I look at a news feed and I can't scroll enough to see the entire contents of a conversation, I know I'm missing something. And I think a lot of people feel frustrated by some mysterious algorithm governing what they see. Um, so I like having a, a counter example of, here's what it looks like to see all of it. And you can kind of choose what seems interesting to you and where to zero in on. Um, and hopefully that can give people some sense of uh, understanding and perspective. Yeah, I, I have one last question for you before uh, we, we go to the audience. Um, and that's, you know, you said that you've been tweeting and, being on, and you've been on Facebook and Instagram interacting with millions of people for years now. Mm. Um, has your social media behavior changed since you came to MIT? Uh, good question. Yeah, it has. I think there are some things that I was already doing. Um, like I've, I've always loved to have this 
intimate relationship with my fans where I want to know how they're doing and I want to understand more about their world. And um, I like them to, to feel like they know that about me. Um, I think my ideal is to open up the process of what I'm exploring to share that with my fans. Um, you know, if, if there are fans of mine that are interested, maybe even watching right now, <laughs> um, in sort of participating in this quest, I, that's what I would really love. Yeah. Um, so that's something I didn't have the opportunity to offer before being here. Great. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions out here? If we don't have an immediate question, I oh, right here, please. Thank you. Paul Boudre with House Studios. Appreciate what you're doing with the arts and, and music. And my question is, if your technology can help solve a social humanitarian problem mm. that's personal to you, what would it be and why? Um, I think maybe coming from coming from the arts my humanitarian problem would be to uh to communicate effectively and to to care about like what i what internally matters to me and then that the the world would understand that so um something that i resonated with what Cortico and the Lab for Social Machines focus on is um, repairing the fragmentation that happens across our country. Um, so I think finding better ways to see each other and repair that fragmentation is important to me. If you don't have a hand up right now, I, I definitely have a follow-up que uh, question, which is um, uh, you talked about intimacy at scale, which is sort of inherently a, a paradox. Mm. And I think you say it understanding that there's like a paradoxical element to it. Um, but as we were talking backstage, I mentioned that, you know, I find that social media is unbelievably, lends itself very easily to narcissism. That when you have an intimate conversation, you're looking at the other person in the eye, you're trying to follow if they understand you, nodding, yes, okay, yeah. we get it. But when you're talking to a million people at once, it's hard to look anyone in the eye. And so necessarily the spotlight of attention turns inward and you just self-broadcast. Right. But you told me about a sort of a hack around this, that you aren't constantly self-broadcasting. Just tell me a little bit about some of the prompts that you use on social media to talk to your fans intimately. Yeah, um, I, I think a mixture is nice, you know, like sometimes sharing, oh, this is what I'm interested in, or this is where I am right now. But if it's strictly about me, I get bored. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's just so much interesting action going on within the lives of my fans that I want to know about. So I just say something like, hey, how's it going? And then I'll get, you know, a couple hundred responses. And then we'll start a conversation. And I get I get really interesting stories from people, you know, from from Canada, from Turkey, from Brazil. Um, and they share intimate things going on in their lives. And we do it with enough regularity that I think they, they kind of feel like I know them. Yeah. It, is it, I think we have a question uh, right back there. Yeah, hi, uh, Steve Palmer from MIT. Could your work be applied to maybe other platforms or threads? So hashtags, for example, uh, is something that scares me. Mm. With uh, young kids at home, if you put in somewhat innocuous hashtag, you could very well be exposed to something pretty graphic. Mm. So could you potentially use your visualizations to uh, examine other mediums? Thanks. Yeah, I think so. Um, the thing that interests me is conversation and how one thing has an effect upon the other. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a structural form that you could do that. And I mean, I've noticed that Instagram, they're having more and more reply chains even within their comment threads. Um, the font is really small and it doesn't draw as much attention to people. So I don't know if it's so much about discourse as Twitter is, but um, yeah, I, I would definitely be interested in that. So these, so these, these trees, they look very different in different so on different social media platforms. That there's more. Where is there the most what you call the vir vir virality? <sighs> where is there the most virality? Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of like different communities that don't necessarily touch. Um, so for instance, this rapper Lil Yachty, like uh, he has such an active fan base and I think that's awesome. Like, and he really talks to them. He actually, he put up this great tweet the other day. He just asked his fans, are you happy? 
And I thought the responses to it were so interesting. He got like thousands of responses. And so I think um, a lot of young people are connecting with each other through artists and entertainers actively. Uh, I also think topics obviously get a lot of attention, kind of what you're saying with the hashtags, like, um, you know, whatever political topic of the moment that's getting heat is probably going to get a lot of activity. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because in a way what you're saying is, um, you know, I feel like there's an old version of celebrity that says kind of like just stick it, stay in your lane, mm. like just talk about your work, talk about your music, the next show that you're working on and that's it. But right now you're saying is that politics has sort of bled into entertainment enough that there are benefits, even incentives for celebrities on social media to wade into those conversations and sort of engender conversations among their following. Potentially. I mean, I, my, my kind of hope with uh, seeing the picture with, you know, the positives and negatives of virality is, is to not just get attention for attention's sake. Uh, I think that's an important aspect, too. Sorry, I think somebody did have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Last question. Thanks. Asta Zelenkoskaita, I'm an associate professor uh, at Drexel University. So my curiosity was about the visualization itself. Um, it seems like a tree structure clearly gives an advantage of the temporal dimension, mm. sort of can, it's compared to network, right? It has this advantage. What would be other reasons why you chose tree as a visualization uh, that gives something structurally beyond looking at specific branches? Uh, I think I like that it sort of seems contained to um, to you know, one, one root, one base, and then showing the effects of that. Um, I think the internet is messy. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to like account for all the ripple effects. Um, but I like that. Uh, I also like the idea of in a reply chain, you see who says what to whom. Um, and I think context is really important. So um, maybe that is already what you're saying with the tree format. But that's the that's the main thing that appeals to me with trees is being able to have the context of like, everybody who's sharing their views as well as um, what preceded what was said. Great. Bridget, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.